In this video, I will review some examples of active versus passive voice in scientific writing. Um, and the focus is on trying to find opportunities to use as much active voice as possible. Now, there's a caveat. You will not be able to use active voice exclusively. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've heard from a lot of uh, folks I've worked with over the years that they've heard at some point in their writing careers, a writing teacher, be it in high school or in college, say you should never, ever use passive voice. And that's, you know, these, these blank statements, uh, I don't think are ne ever really useful. So the goal is to minimize passive voice as much as possible, but there are actually times particularly when you're writing in a scientific context, where passive voice is needed and appropriate. And um, in our next module, we'll cover sentence structure. And if you want to have some varied sentence structure, passive voice can actually be a great tool to accomplish that as well. So I'm going to show you some examples throughout the lesson here as well, throughout this video as well. Um, so I'm going to take some examples from different, um, different publications uh, there's a website here that I've taken a lot of examples from that I'm going to put in supplemental materials at Blackboard. Uh, it's a handout from the University of Toronto, so make sure you check that out. So let's get right into it. So first of all, um, let's just look at active versus passive voice. So the first sentence here, additionally increased sensitivity to IR post AZ treatment can be explained by decreased expression of NH, EJ, factor, KU80. Typical passive construction, um, you have the, the by, right, it's sort of my tip, look for anything that says by, because in many cases that actually hides who is doing the action, right? Because increased sensitivity to IR post ASA treatment is not doing the explaining, it is being explained by this decreased expression. So this is a quick fix, and I would almost always recommend to do that when you have a clear actor hiding in this by construction to change it. There are some exceptions, and we'll I'll show you some example an example of that as well. But in general, that's one way you can start looking for passive voice. So the revision, additionally, decreased expression of NHEJ factor KU80 can explain or explains, depending on how confident you feel about how well this particular thing can explain something. So can explain or explains increased sensitivity to IR post ASA treatment. Now the sentences aren't really that radically different. The first sentence isn't wrong, it's grammatically correct. It could even be an appropriate sentence depending on what comes before or after. But as a reader, um, it is a lot easier to follow active sentences and to be drawn into a text when there is more, the more active language is used. So keep that in mind. If you want to engage your reader, really pay attention to moments where you can change passive to active. And this is one of these great opportunities. So a couple of more examples which um, I often see in, uh, in science writing, particularly in journal writing, in writing about you know, the method section about certain things that have been done in an experiment. So we often see this first example. To investigate the source of nutrients, eggshell membranes were compared. I'm like, well, it's not wrong, but if you really want to be clearer to your reader, tell them who's doing the comparison. If you're a team of researchers, here is the revision in active voice. To investigate the source of nutrients, we compared eggshell membranes clearly writing yourself in as the agent of the actions. Now, of course, you want to avoid having each sentence in your method section saying, we did this, and then we did this, and then we did this. It can get monotonous as well. As well. So it's, again, about variance and balance, but knowing when to change passive to active to make your reader, have your reader be more engaged is a really useful tool and certainly it's one of it's one of the principles that I really wanted to emphasize in this course. So let me look at um at a sample paragraph from an article that I've taken from the University of Toronto's um uh handout and their URL is on the bottom here as well but you can also 
if you look back in Blackboard on the supplemental materials, you'll see the full citation and the link to it as well. And I strongly suggest take a look at it. You can download it as a PDF file or look at it right on the screen. So here, this is our paragraph and it comes from an introduction. And so it's not from a, from a method section where I would expect a good amount of passive voice. But in an introduction, you know, you're still drawing the reader into what you're trying to say and showing the larger context of your work. Um, too much passive voice can really be deterrent to actively engaging the reader. So let's read this together. More than 50 LLRK2 mutations are known now, right? There is our first passive. All of the mutations, mostly missense mutations, were found in and so on, heterozygotes segregated with the disease and were, were not detected in a control sample. In addition, LRRK2 mutations were not detected in other neurological disorders. Autosomal dominant PDS, PD was demonstrated to result. So every sentence has a passive construction. For an introduction, that's a little overkill. So if I were to rewrite this, and it's a little hard to revise this because I'm not really sure who is doing all this work, so I'm going to have to make some things up here, so bear with me. So the first sentence, more than 50 LRRK mutations are known now. Um, maybe we could say something like um, uh, much of recent research um, has identified more than uh, 50 LRK mutations, right? So I have an active construction here. Much of recent research has identified this and this and this. The next sentence, all of the mutations mostly were found in heterozygotes segregated. So here I'm like, well, who is doing the finding? So maybe, uh, maybe writing something like, um, many scientists or researchers, or whoever it is, um, found um, or probably just scientists scientists found all of the mutations blah blah, blah and heterozygotes segregated with the disease um, and detected them in a control sample and it might even be particular people um, you know and my favorites Johnson and Smith or maybe even you know Nobel Prize winners or the, the renowned experts in this area, blah, 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 Johnson and Smith, found these mutations. So again, taking out the passive and, you know, in this case, inventing an actor, because again, I don't 100% know who the actor is, but if I were the author, I would probably not. Um, then next sentence, in addition, which I like, the way transition, LRRK2 mutations were not detected in other neurological disorders. So again, in addition, um, these authors or they did not uh, detect and by they I refer to the scientists before I'm assuming they did not detect LRK mutations in other neurological disorders. Autosomal dominant PD was demonstrated again whoever is doing the demonstrating and this is where I'm struggling a little bit because I'm not really sure who's doing it but I hope this was clear looking at the first three sentences how making this more active, using active voice rather than the passive voice, creates a much more engaging narrative for your reader, especially in the introduction. So let's look at a few more examples from the University of Toronto. So this is from a method section of a journal article, again, where I probably would expect to find passive voice. Oh, and going back to, uh, sorry, going back to this previous passage, the other problem here is, right, I don't really know who's doing all these things. That's why I, as the fake uh, fake writer have to invent who is doing this but again as a real writer I would know in the introduction I want to know who is doing what in a method section going back to this example here I know it's the authors of the article so using passive voice in here it's not really obscuring who is who has done something in this particular context so nucleotide sequences were analyzed using the state and software package alignment was performed the numbers so were analyzed Sorry, my pen here is uh, not working. So um, let me fix this here. So nucleotide sequences were analyzed using the Statin 153 software package. Alignment was performed. Um, there is the second passive. 
uh, provided in the mega package, the number of haplo, haplotypes and so on were evaluated. So were analyzed, um, was performed and were evaluated are giving you all these, you know, lots like three different passive constructions, but again, in the method section, that's okay. Could you switch it up and maybe say in the same, second sentence, we performed um, alignment using the cluster program, or in the last sentence, um, we evaluated the number of haplotypes to give it some variance? Probably, but I wouldn't necessarily change every passive in this, in this passage of three sentences, right, because it gives you variance. Let's see if this pen works again. There it is. So I would maybe do something like we evaluated the number of peplotides and so on um, using blah, 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 blah. Okay, so it gives me a little bit of variance in the passive. But again, the method section, um, it's not uncommon. Now, of course, you are going to practice writing, if you use option one for this assign for assignment this week, um, your own method section using as much active voice as possible, so be judicious about it. If you're comparing uh, the two method sections of the articles, think about how you can make some of these active rather than passive. Doesn't mean you're not going to have any passive voice, but try to minimize it as much as possible. So here are three more examples um, where you can you know, use authors or other what I call agents as active subjects. So here it's Nambu et al have reported a theoretical study. So sometimes I find writers saying like this study or it wasn't reported in this study that. Well, make the study or the authors the actual subject. So Nam Wen Al have reported a theoretical study of weight formation in the presence of a magnetic field parallel and so on and so on. Next sentence, another way to phrase it, while a large body of literature has explored large scale geographical patterns and several recent papers have studied disease dynamics in the meta population framework, Few empirical studies have focused on the patterns and so on. And you again notice here the citations and references are missing, not to clutter the text. So here in this passage, what the writer is doing, rather than using passive voice, um, the writer is using sort of these, you know, inanimate objects, a large body of literature, several recent papers, few empirical studies to, this, to make active sentences rather than passive sentences. It's a great strategy, especially the literature review, which I think these passages are from an introduction of lit review. And the last sentence is also from um, it's from a method section or results section. And I see this often when people write about their own tables. They say, oh, in this table it is shown that. Well, make the table the actual um, agent. So table table one shows the frequencies of the study. Inanimate objects can do things in research writing studies, tables, um, papers, and so on, they can have a subject position in terms of the sentence structure. Okay, so two more examples when passive voice actually really might work in your favor is if you have an unknown, irrelevant, or obvious actor. So for example, the sentence here, many devastating pathogens are passively dispersed and the epidemics are characterized by variation that is typically attributed to environmental factors. So if I wanted to change are passively dispersed and are characterized, are characterized, well, I don't know who's doing the dispersing or characterizing, and that's not really as important as the pathogens and their epidemics. That's the center of the sentence. So it should be in the subject, sub, subject position, meaning you have to use passive voice. So it's okay in that instance. So when you're writing your papers, think strategically where you use your active voice and where passive voice might be a better choice. The other instance where you want to use the passive voice is where the non-actor or recipient is at the center, it's similar to the first example. So the differentiation of the two intra-island ecologically differentiated subspecies in the Azores is not supported by the molecular data. So you see here the by. And remember I said earlier, whenever you see that, it's a good, it's a good indicator to maybe change to active voice. So you could say the molecular data did not support the differentiation of two intra-island and so on. But if you really need to emphasize the differentiation of two intra-island ecologically differentiated subspecies in the Azores, then that should be in the subject, subject position, even though you have a clear actor here. So you don't always have to rewrite passive voice, even when you have a clear actor hiding with the by. There are moments where, because of sentence flow and narrative, the passive voice is more appropriate. So as with anything else in life, it's all about balance.